this organization is actually doing the hard work of informing people of the news that is underreported and in many cases unreported. So I, I want to thank Alternative View and Ian Crane for inviting me to be with you this evening. I have two artistic offerings and I hope you will consider them as uh, quite a treat. While I was recently in Cape Town, South Africa, I discovered a wonderful group called Desert Rose, and they performed the song that you're about to hear now. They sang in Hebrew, Arabic, and English with such passion and in such dulcet tones, it found my open heart. This tune and the video stay with me wherever I go, a combination of haunting tones set to scenes that I actually saw myself on my triumphal entry into Gaza. Triumphal because I tried three times to get into Gaza, as you heard, to see for myself what the controversy had been about, to see for myself what Operation Cast Lead was about, and to see what the people of Gaza were all about. What I will tell you this evening is my story that rarely gets told objectively in the special interest media. My story is blocked out by special interest right wing and left side media. I'll leave it to you when you hear my story to wonder why. I would like for us to call up now the Desert Rose video, which by the way is banned in South Africa. The name of this video is Who Is Your God?
everything that I say this evening is truly about shifting the paradigm to dignity and justice and truth and peace. I received a call on day one of Israel's Operation Cast Lead asking me to please get on a boat and go to Gaza to deliver much needed medical supplies to people being bombarded with depleted uranium munitions, cluster bombs, white phosphorus from F-16s and helicopter gunships, all in an area about twice the size of Washington, D.C. with no way out for the people to escape. Much to my mother's dismay, I immediately said yes. We all saw, thanks to Al Jazeera and Press TV, the bombs raining down on the people. There was no way I was going to turn down an appeal to help because I had been there before. It was like deja vu for me. In 1991, I had stayed up all night, mesmerized by the US bombs falling on Baghdad. And I couldn't believe that something so beautiful that looked like 4th of July fireworks could be so deadly. George Herbert Walker Bush had given us seven reasons why war on Iraq was necessary. Not a single one of those reasons was good enough for me. So as a member of the Georgia legislature, I asked the Speaker of the House if I could speak on a point of personal privilege. The speaking time was granted to me, and I went to the well of the House to explain my position. I recounted the history of US aggressions against countries populated by people of color. I announced that I rejected our president's seven points for war and then intoned that George Bush ought to be ashamed of himself for launching Operation Desert Storm against the Iraqi people. My colleagues stood up and walked out on me. Their action was carried in every major newspaper around our state. The members changed the rules to test my loyalty to the United States, my harmless environmental legislation to establish a study committee to examine whether environmental racism was the reason why metropolitan Atlanta's blackest zip code also suffered the highest toxic releases, died for a lack of a second. And then out of guilt and probably respect to one of the speaker's old hands confessed to me that he had been instructed to kill the bill in retribution for my remarks. He apologized to me for going along with the speaker's dictate. I was at least gratified that the truth had been spoken by me and by my new friend who was one of the longest serving colleagues in the Georgia House. After that, I ran for the US Congress with the platform that all of our relations, both foreign and domestic, have to have one foundation, and that is respect for human rights. As a child of the civil rights movement, I knew what lack of human rights meant in the Confederate South of America. I had been there with my father at demonstrations and on picket lines. On one hot and humid Alabama day, I even faced the Klan, armed and spewing their hate, and I knew how our dignity had been won. Our dignity had been won because black men were wearing reaffirming signs around their necks, proclaiming, I am a man. Our dignity had been won because black men and women who spoke out of turn or cast a glance too long at a white person or dared to assert their dignity as human beings ended their lives wearing ropes around their necks, swinging from trees, that strange fruit that, made, that Billie Holiday made famous. Because also children on the front lines faced mobs as they tried to enter school just to learn, facing water hoses and dogs just for a share of the rights in the Bill of Rights and the United States Constitution that was for everybody else. University students sat in in Greensboro, North Carolina, placing a simple demand 
just to be served. These were some of the actions that helped our country join the community of nations. So I understood aggression for oppression when I saw it. There was no room in my view for nuclear weapons, NATO expansion, or discrimination against any person, group, or country. While in the Congress, I voted against every Pentagon budget that came before me, believing it immoral to spend so much money on war when millions of our children go to bed hungry every night. I introduced legislation to eliminate the use of depleted uranium, to ban the importation of coltan from the Democratic Republic of Congo into the United States because of the horrific human rights abuses committed during its mining, despite the fact that Bill Gates needed Colton to power his Xbox and our other 21st century gadgets. I introduced legislation to stop the transfer of US weapons to regimes that did not respect human rights. I represented the Congressional Black Caucus at the Durban World Conference Against Racism, despite intense pressure to not attend in order to avoid a discussion of Zionism. I was the first member of Congress to ask the Bush administration of the September 11, 2001 attack on the United States, what did it know and when did it know it? I defied the Democratic leadership that had instructed Democrats to stay away from a congressional panel created to investigate the government's response to Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Not only did I participate, I held a town hall meeting in New Orleans, received testimony from residents there, and invited residents to Washington, D.C. to tell their stories to the congressional panel, and wrote legislation based on what I learned from the Katrina survivors to punish with loss of federal funds and equipment for the period of one year any law enforcement agency that denied the civil rights of its residents, and believe me, that did happen. And two, environmental legislation mandating that health effects of the toxic brew still resident on everything in New Orleans and other affected areas be made public so people would know before they moved back and before cleanup crews went to work just what the environmental hazards were that people faced, similar to what happened at Ground Zero in September 11th. Fed up with the lies of the Bush administration after its election theft in 2000, which I used the Congressional Office to investigate, as well as September 11th and the Iraq War, I filed articles of impeachment against George Bush, Dick Cheney, and Condoleezza Rice. I left Washington. I left Washington not because I chose to, but because the Israel lobby inside the United States was able to utilize all of its leverage inside both the Democratic and Republican parties and targeted me. They targeted me because I dared to believe that the United States should work toward peace and dignity for all human beings, including Palestinians. As a result, I was the only Democratic member of Congress to lose re-election in 2006. The significance of the 2006 election was this. The very first bill to fund the war came up for a House vote and passed with exactly the number of votes required. Had I been there to cast my no vote, the bill would have failed. We would be talking about how we're going to spend our peace dividend now. Like, for example, free tuition through the PhD for students. But instead, the war party that consists of pro-war elements inside both the Democratic and Republican parties made sure they controlled enough congressional votes to keep our country at war. And so now President Obama is poised to spend the most on war in one year since President Bush began the global war on terror. In 2007, I declared my independence from every bomb dropped 
every threat leveled, every civil liberties rolled back, every child killed, every veteran maimed, every man tortured as a part of the U.S. war machine. And I began working with the Brussels Tribunal to hold both Blair and Bush accountable for their war crimes in Iraq. In 2008, the Green Party nominated me to lead their ticket, and I ran for president with Rosa Clemente as my vice presidential running mate. Our Power to the People campaign was based on the universal application of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I spoke out against President Clinton's sanctions against Iraq and President George W. Bush's war against an occupation of Iraq. I am now organizing against President Obama's escalation of U.S. troops in Afghanistan, the continued U.S. troop presence in Iraq, the drone attacks against Afghanistan, Somalia, Pakistan, and the continued detention of innocents in Guantanamo. I am now working with the former Prime Minister of Malaysia to criminalize war and with other activists to hold U.S. and U.K. leaders accountable for their choices to take our countries to war, committing torture, war crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes against the peace, and genocide along the way. Underlying it all is my belief in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So when I was called by the Free Gaza Movement, not once but twice, to help the people of Gaza, I didn't hesitate. Now I'll talk more about the experience that I had trying to get to Gaza and what I saw after I arrived in Gaza on Sunday. Since I've left Congress, I've had the opportunity to meet tremendously talented young people all across the United States, and their stories are not being told because the U.S. population has to be prepped for more war. I've encountered stories of tremendous pain and sacrifice that U.S. politicians are afraid to address because the only views that are acceptable are those that support more war. As you will see from this next film, the United States joins the UK and France as having had its own version of the Intifada earlier this year because of the utter oppression faced by black and brown young people living in the US. This short documentary was prepared by the young people of Oakland, California after the murder of Oscar Grant and the palpable fear of elected officials that kept quiet for seven whole days. On the seventh day of silence by everyone who was elected, the city erupted. Young people of color in Oakland took to the streets for several days. Recently, the courts just granted a change of venue to the rogue BART, which is the Bay Area Rapid Transit law enforcement officer who murdered Oscar Grant. That officer could pull the trigger in Oakland, but he doesn't want to accept Oakland justice. Oscar Grant was murdered because he questioned the actions of the white officer who had handcuffed and was roughing up Oscar's Latino friend. When Oscar objected to the treatment of his friend, Oscar was accorded the old-fashioned justice reserved for blacks who didn't know their place or who dared to question white authority. I debuted this short documentary in Cape Town, South Africa, at its first Palestinian film festival. And what Cape Town, South Africa, Oakland, California, and Gaza, Palestine share is all too familiar in our experiences as people just trying to be free. I present to you now and will be available for questions after that, Operation Small Acts. What you won't see on CNN, Sky News, Fox, or the BBC. In fact, I checked the BBC just now to see what, how, 
they reported this incident. There was one story total. And the video on BBC is censored. It doesn't show the officer actually shooting and killing Oscar Grant, although it was a part of the video that they posted. Sadly, scenes like this are played out on American streets all over the country. If I choose to run for Congress again, it will be because of the outraged voices of people like these whose elected representatives are too afraid to speak out on their behalf. You are about to see the uncensored video, Operation Small Acts, the story of murder and its aftermath, the Oscar Grant Rebellion. people revolting. It's some of the worst rioting the region has seen in years. Police were calm right now in Oakland, California, went ignored as anger boiled over at a controversial police shooting. Rioters busted windows, set fires, and pounced on police cars. One woman tried to defend the violence. How do you feel about the origins of the police forces being slave catchers? And now you are walking through Oakland, a black man wearing a slave catcher's uniform. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't agree with you. You don't agree with the fact that Harriet Tubman had to run her ass through a fucking trench full of shit? You don't agree that you shouldn't wear that fucking uniform? Are you kidding? Say fuck the You know, the police, you know what I'm saying? The, the system has filled, you know, all black men in Oakland. See, you lollygagging, Dallas. You lollygagging, man. You lollygagging, man. That's unfair. Call for some charges. Yeah. You scared walking on the streets? I ain't afraid of anybody walking, brother. You real me? Then they handcuffed me like this. Then they handcuffed my wrist to my ankles and start kicking me all up in here, right? What? That boy didn't do nothing. They shot him in his back while he was already subdued and all. He was handcuffed. Yeah, handcuffed. Come on now. Yeah, he had handcuffs on. And dude had his fucking knee and his fucking neck. We fighting against the system, the big trees. We the small lacks. We the oppressed peoples. JR is a brother that I've been knowing that's been down with the struggle for years. He's the Minister of Information and he did an article in the Bayview about my incident with the police. Jail Messaline the killer cops. Our family will fuck you up and kill you over our family. So, you know, we value ours, and we're gonna teach y'all how to value yours, or else get fucked up. Move. The way I chopped at these big trees in which we was fighting the city government, the police, was basically I was covering the people's perspective and why the people was upset about the rebellion. That's when the police attacked me and basically arrested me on a felonious charge of arson. A police officer should be ashamed mm -hmm. to call himself an investigator after what he testified to in court. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, that's under oath, and I'm sure that some perjury was involved in what happened today. But the idea of the judge stating on the record that it borders on recklessness for JR to stand up for his rights and defend himself when he's not guilty shows what kind of justice
people can expect from this system that I believe is criminal for its injustice. Mm -hmm. We've just seen that today. The judge told me I was reckless because I didn't plead to a lesser charge, and I'm not pleading to no lesser charge because I'm innocent. GRX right for the paper it was covering what was going on. I'm not pleading to no charge. I'm innocent. We're going to fight it. It's just really a shame that I got to fight a case eight month, for eight months that I'm completely innocent of, and they know that I'm innocent of. And of course, the police been at jail a long time. And the uh, only thing we can do is stand up and fight it. All around the world, oppressive governments, the white power structure has used agent provocateurs. This is definitely one of the tactics they use to basically not just silence you, but lay a, 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 a justification to eventually assassinate you. As you can see in the case of Steve Biko, Patrice Lumumba, Malcolm X, Huey P. Noon. At the end of February 2009, we celebrated the birthday of Oscar Grant, who was killed by the police. And we were raising money for his daughter. Basically right now in a turbulent, very turbulent time with a lot of things going on. So since we're getting infiltrated right now because this Oscar Grant movement or whatnot, they find in like a loophole, they find in like a, a kink in our armor because of all of this activity around this brother getting caught on tape dying um, at the hands of a police. So now they feeling like it's room to send agents provocateurs and police informants and FBI informants and other people into our organizations. Um, so now I think we have to kind of close ranks. Agent provocateur, self-confessed agent provocateur, Mandingo Hayes, came and started a fight to disrupt, discredit, and neutralize, possibly get people caught up in cases. He did all this to crush the movement uh, of resistance that's going on against city government and the police in Oakland with the people versus the police and the city government. No. See, we got things called uh, agent provocateurs and shit, you know what I'm saying? See, provocateurs. I don't know which one the provocateur. I know one of them is, though, for sure. Because it's supposed to be about unity. Motherfuckers bringing that bullshit. It says Oakland Black Panther Mandingo Hayes, Chairman Mandingo Hayes, New Black Panther Mandingo Hayes, Oakland Big Black Panther Mandingo Hayes. This is why our shit gets fucked up. Motherfuckers want to infiltrate and show up. They about some bullshit. With Mandingo Hayes informant, who wants to see what you come up with? Can people just pop up with a black jogging stone? With black jackets on from Walmart, and we have no questions asked. And we said, they're Panthers, we're new Panthers. Oh, what, what, what? Grinning at you. What happened, man? What are you doing? What is that? What are you doing? Lavelle Mixon was in his mid-20s. He was basically profiled on the streets of Oakland, like so many other people are. He was living in an area that's under police occupation. Police are constantly, unjustly stopping people up and down the MacArthur Strip in Oakland. Much like how they do in a war-torn country, whether we're talking about Palestine, Iraq, Afghanistan, or even apartheid South Africa. Same thing. In this particular case, apparently he wasn't taking it. Police 2, Oakland residents 4. This is a commentary by the POCC Minister of Information, JR of BlockReportRadio.com. If you fast forward three months later, after the first of a series of Oakland rebellions made the police arrest BART Police trigger man Johannes Meserly in Nevada, and after the bailing out of Meserly for $300,000, on March 21st, 26 year old Lavelle Mixon was murdered by Oakland police after allegedly killing four of them on MacArthur Boulevard off of 73rd and East Oakland. It took the young brother to stand up and be a man. He let him know, you're coming to kill me, I'm going to take you with me. You're coming to kill me. Let's go. Let's do this. Ironically, thousands of people at the same time Lavelle lost his life were protesting the war in Iraq where San Francisco police attacked the crowd. But only dozens gathered to see what happened to Lavelle Mixon, who let his actions speak about what he thought of the racial profiling in our community. My son was loved. There was something behind his pain. There was something behind his anger. There was something behind his frustration and his fear. There was something there. And there certainly was a human being. And that was a brother who we shouldn't have lost. 
to go out like that. He was a straight up soldier. His mama didn't raise no punk. Oh, we keeping it mixed, we straight up. Keeping it mixed, man. Keep it. So we can stop and pray for this brother right here, because we loved him too. R.P. East Oak Big King, 82nd good, birth, man. man. Straight up. This time, instead of the Gaza Strip in the Middle East, we're talking about the MacArthur Strip in East Oakland. Instead of the occupation force of the Israelis in Palestine or the Americans in Iraq or Afghanistan, the low-income black communities in America are dealing with the police, FBI, ATF, and DEA, to name a few. Instead of a suicide bomber or a sniper holed up in a building, Lavelle turned out to be a suicide sniper who used a gun instead of a bomb to take out enemies of the community. You don't see no tears, no, none. Ain't nobody crying out here. I know what I, this is the last Like Malcolm X would say, it's the chickens coming home to roost, you know what I'm saying? You gotta live in the bed that you created. The reality is when you go to the scene, which I did a number of times, you see very few residents of the area, specifically young black males, with any sympathy for the officers because for decades, Oakland police officers have ran rampant over the black community, including Dunnigan, one of the ones killed who was a sheriff who patrolled North Oakland reaping hell on young black males. Y'all better be cool. They after everybody. You look like a nigga they won't. <laughs> <laughs> What's your message to the police right now, man? What's something you like to say to the police? Fuck right these goddamn cluckers, feel me? They ain't number cluckers, feel me? How you feel about these officers getting shot right out here now? They need to get knocked down. They deserve it. Two, two, threes. Look, you see how they standing? You're supposed to have a chop right now pointing that way to my... Go ask me. Four of them got knocked down, though. That's how they rocking? And it's gonna be... Nigga, what's they call that? Uh, state of emergency. Oh yeah, Oakland, state of emergency. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, Dad, we gonna do it like that. Now that the rabbit has begun, the police and the media want us to forget the despair that they now feel, that we usually feel, repeatedly. We are discriminately killed in the streets by police, except in our cases, we know that no police officer is gonna serve any real time for murdering members of our community. These two cases are unrelated, like people in the San Francisco Chronicle have been saying, Oscar Grant and Lavelle Mixon. Then why has Meserly's trial been put off for so long? To all the three strike supporters, police sympathizers, and prison industry businessmen, how does it feel when the rabbit has the gun? Welcome to East Oakland. This is the city of Oscar Grant. This is also um, the city of Lavelle Mixon. And I, and I want to say that, um, that, that, that story did not have to happen the way it did. You know, had, had police crimes, police brutality been dealt with in Oakland, that story would have ended very differently. Operation Small Axe went to the scene. You didn't get, we didn't get it translated through government sanctioned media, mainstream media. We talked to the people about what they saw and how they felt. And basically, what people felt was they were tired of what was happening to us. They, it was, they were happy to see the enemy ha feel how we feel. They was happy to see retribution. They was happy to see the police sitting in our seat for a change. Because so many times they kill us and nothing happens. It's, it's, they call it justifiable homicide. I want y'all to know what's going on here in Oakland, California. We know what's going on in Gaza. We want y'all to see that y'all movements is being fought for right here on this soil. In the ghetto, we know what's going on. We want the ghettos in Gaza, the West Bank. We want y'all to know what's going on with us so that y'all can represent Lavelle Mixon, represent Oscar Grant out there on your territory and so that the resistance struggle could be internationally and we could be included in y'all mind frame and y'all international analysis just like y'all included in our international analysis. Block Report, Operation Small Axe. Until the full length movie, man, we out. Like Malcolm X would say, it's the chickens coming home to roost. You know what I'm saying? You gotta live in the bed that you created. Okay, so now we are going to have a little uh, Q&A time. And I understand that. Okay, fantastic. Hi, Cynthia. Thank you very much for coming along. Hi. It's a pleasure. I just have a, an overall question because your, your video presentation and the way you speak and I know a lot about your work previously because I've done my research, it raises a lot of emotions in me. 
And one of my biggest questions I ask myself every day is because uh, I do a lot of work about confronting the, the tyrannical system. And in my personal view, the dialectic between freedom and tyranny is perpetual and that we'll always have to fight it. But will we be able to remove or force these dark forces out of power in the, we will call them the new world order, peacefully? Or will there need to be another uprising revolution as we've seen many times in history? We learn from history and many people say to me, we cannot fight a particular consciousness stream with the same consciousness stream that created it. But it's a pleasure listening to you and seeing these videos. In my heart, I know that there may need to be a fight. So my question to you, Cynthia, is what is your opinion on the fact? Will we be able to do this peacefully or will the people have to realize that we outnumber them about 10 million to one and kick them out? Well, I, I think that the people that um, are a part of our global oppression understand that we outnumber them. And so that's why I was so elated when I understood what Alternative View was all about and that Alternative View will soon become AVTV. And just imagine, just as young JR said in his closing remarks, that um, if we internationalize our struggle, but then we also have a medium of communication so that we all know what everyone else is doing. And I think that's possible if we globalize AVTV. And actually, the people in South Africa have a television channel that people in South Africa that I was with have a television channel that's been shut down by the ANC because they're so uh, forceful in their search and exposition of the truth. So suppose we all join together. We fight our local battles where we must fight them. And then we also internationalize our resistance. I do believe that we can win. Now, we, I think, you know, just like President Obama doesn't take anything off the table, we shouldn't take anything off the table either. We have to understand what our resources are, where our resources are, and how we can best utilize them in our effort to, all we want is peace. They're the ones who want war and injustice and to rob us of our dignity. So surely we ought to be able to win. And actually, we've seen victories. We've seen victories all over Latin America, if we look. We can see those victories. We see the resistance even in Haiti. Even as Haiti um, uh, is under United Nations occupation, but they, uh, the people are still aware enough that when I was in prison, in an Israeli prison for seven days, they showed up in front of the Israeli embassy to protest. So there is this ability, I believe, for us to link up. We just have to put the mechanism together to do so. And through the international travels that I have been so honored to be a part of, I can see it and actually help make that happen. Okay, can we have the next one, please? Yeah. Hello, Cynthia. Oh, is that David? <laughs> Hello. Oh, I love David. <laughs> David saved um, my life, y'all. No, I didn't. <laughs> yes, he did, too, because well, I, I didn't know I how to swim, and I had my life jacket um, on backwards. Cynthia, I was very interested. <laughs> I was very interested to, to, see your, to, see you, to see you state, hear you state, that that video, the first one, the song, the pictures still and moving of Palestinian suffering in the recent Shoah had been banned in South Africa. Yes. Is that right? Now, yes. That's of interest because you know that the most, uh, the best allies for apartheid South Africa were Britain, America, yes. and Israel. Yes, that's And correct. they, in fact, the latter tiny country of about six million people, cooperated with South Africans in germ warfare, I think also in the development of a nuclear weapon in South Africa, it is said. What I'd like to know is who in South Africa, what organ of state, banned that harmless video? You know, if, if any country should be showing that video, 
should be a South Africa. So what I'm asking you really is who banned it and what is your feeling about South Africa? Are there actors who were there 30 years ago still behind the curtain pulling the strings? Um, my trip to South Africa was so enlightening. Um, I learned so much because these young men who had the television station that had been banned were uh, a part of the resistance against the apartheid regime. And so they understand fully how the ANC came to be the, um, the resistance organization that uh, finally won the uh, favor and was able to become the government. But right now, for those of you who might not be aware, South Africa is literally on fire, as was uh, the situation in Oakland, because the major unions all over South Africa have been out on strike against that same ANC government. The organization that banned the song was the South African Rabbinical Society. And um, of course, because of the relationship, the close relationship now between the oppressors and the ANC government, sadly enough to say, um, uh, the, the group Desert Rose has effectively been banned all over South Africa. Um, <clears throat> I've heard what you said about the work you're doing, which is uh, superb. Have you seen a video on the uh, the uh, internet called The Hidden Secrets of the Alpha Course? The Hidden Secret of... I think it's a religious course. No. The Alpha Course is a religious in inverted commas type crusade um, but it has huge hidden significance and, and meaning to the subject that you are most concerned about whilst you're well you should be able to get it of course anywhere in the world but if you google alpha course or the hidden secrets of the alpha course you may actually learn additional information that you're not aware of equally there is another website called uh, Kill the Best Gentiles, uh, which equally reveals fascinating information. So you might like to make a mental note of those and have a look at them. Kill the Best? Gentiles. OK. Uh, the name of the author of the book eludes me. The author of the Hidden Secrets of the Alpha Course is J.D. Christian. Whether that's a nom de plume or his real name, I'm not sure. But he's a New Zealander. Uh, I'm m mentioning this because it may well be uh, of interest to members of the audience as much as uh, the speakers, and particularly yourself. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what it is because um, if, I, if it is about what I think it is about, I do have a comment to make. Uh, sorry, you've asked me if I would just uh, enlarge a little bit? Yes, please. Now, you've mentioned the word Zionism several times. Yes. And the gentleman over here asked who it would appear was behind censoring the film in South Africa. Yes. Now, I, I first heard of this phenomenon three, four years ago, and I've done quite a bit of reading and study about it since. Uh, let me give you a synopsis very briefly then about the Alpha Course as you've inquired. Uh, the Alpha Course would appear to have much more significance than would appear on the surface. Have you heard of it in America or not? The Alpha Course? I never heard of it at all until you just mentioned it. Okay. Well, it's a, it, it, it appears to be an evangelical Christian movement 
in this country. Uh, and uh, But it may well be masquerading under disinformation or uh, an umbrella. Uh, the aim would appear to be spreading the Christian message and people are invited on courses and there is significant likeness to brainwashing to some of their techniques. Now, uh, you've mentioned the Zionist aspect and there is a faction of world Zionism who are intent on conquering the world. And it goes back to biblical times. The battle between Christians, uh, Christian Jews, and non-Christian Jews. Now, it, it may seem far-fetched, but from the reading I've done, uh, it appears very significant. Now, the that battle is heavily influenced and conducted by the banking fraternity. And the banking fraternity have very close interests with this Zionist faction that I've mentioned. And in fact, the Alpha Course campaign is financed by UBS Warburg, who are a very major merchant bank and probably controlled by the people I've just mentioned. So, uh, now the parameters and the scope of the subjects covered in that book, The Hidden Secrets of the Of Course, are mind-blowing. I mean, I'll just give you a few examples. I, I, I think I get your drift. Okay. Um, and I think what would also be of uh, interest, I believe, to this audience would, uh, along the same lines, would be the book that I am currently reading. The author is Jeff Gates. And uh, the title of the book is Guilt by Association. Now, of course, I have experienced what it's like to be targeted by the Israel lobby um, in the United States. But most people inside the United States don't understand how the lobby actually operates so that it can control the votes of the 535 members of Congress. And Jeff Gates, in that book, explains it very well, such that during Operation Cast Lead, there were only five members out of 535 members of Congress who voted no um, when the resolution called for supporting Israel. You might have some interest in the resolution that was just passed by the House of Representatives that spoke to the Goldstone Report and basically criticized the United Nations for daring to um, uh, make such a report and then to do such an investigation. Well, the interesting thing that is not being reported is that contained in that resolution was the green light for Israel to attack Syria and Iran. So now the United States House of Representatives has gone on, on record in support of more aggressive action. I think it is critical for the people of the United Kingdom to know how you came to be engaged in this war. I think it's critical for the people of the United States to know how it is that they came to be engaged in this series of wars. And why is it that Dick Cheney could make a list of 60 countries and say that the United States needs to go and fight all 60 of those countries and even against the interests of people who are working families in the United States, even against the entire national interest of the United States, we have got to do something to figure out how it is that, now this is some new information that I just found out, and that is that the NATO countries ended up in Afghanistan because they were called immediately after September 11th happened by 
the United States government. And the United States requested an ambassador level meeting. At that meeting, they said, we've been attacked. You've all seen it. We, NATO is a collective defense organization, so we invoke our collective defense. We need you to go to war against those people who are making war on us. We know who did it. We know where they are. We've got the evidence. But guess what? They said, but it's secret, so we can't share it with you. And just like that, all of the NATO countries sent their young, their treasure into Afghanistan. And look at what's happening now. Just like that. That's how I'm told that it happened. Yes, Cynthia, I, personally speaking, uh, for me, one of the most shameful acts in my life was the public execution of an innocent man in the London Underground. And, uh, which was nothing more than state murder. Um, the police lied to us. There was all sorts of puffer jackets. He was leaping. None of this was true. And then they managed to silence the majority of people in our country by saying, we are civilized, you must not resort to violence. What do we do when people swallow the blatant mendacity of the authorities with this execution of this young man? And it was an execution, make no mistakes, eight bullets into the head on an underground train and then backed up with lies. The person that gave the order has subsequently been promoted and the then commissioner of the Metropolitan Police is now doing the lecture tour. How do we, is there any alternative but um, violent struggle? Because if you try to argue with these people on an intellectual basis, they will just be deaf to it. And if you try to use ridicule and humor, it may be lost to the greater majority who might see the point at the time of the joke, but forget about it the next day. And I know in America you've had far more experience of barbaric police treatment, but is now creeping into England, and now we are seeing uh, we're going to have armed police all over our country, which is, to me, the government are using terrorism which as an excuse, and there is so little evidence for it. What can we do to bring these people to book or down, if you prefer, without resorting to violence? Because personally speaking, as a law-abiding citizen, I'm at my wit's end. Um... <laughs> There's a lot of us who are also at our wit's end. And in many respects, I, in many audiences, too many audiences, I have said, I don't understand the American people. I don't understand why we are uh, allowing this to happen to us. The civil liberties rollback is incredible. I mean, you know, some people of color, we never had very many civil liberties, so we understand. But the larger white community is now experiencing what we've begun, what we've already always uh, uh, experienced. And yet, there hasn't been the kind of outcry that you would think uh, that certainly is warranted. But I suggest that we take a page from our people who are to the south of us who have successfully resisted. The fact that I don't really, you know, raise up uh, Lula in Brazil too much because, you know, he gave the go-ahead to put, send the troops of occupation into Haiti. But the fact of the matter is that it was um, a resounding, totally unexpected, revolutionary victory when he won in Brazil. And like so with uh, Chavez, who has remained true, uh, to the cause, Chavez in Venezuela, and we've got Correa in Ecuador, and we've got Bolivia and Paraguay, and we've got so many states that have turned the page, and we've got a very potent, active resistance in Mexico that, of course, probably doesn't get very much reportage here, but is uh, definitely alive and well. And after the theft of the election in Mexico at the presidential level, Mexico City was shut down for six months. And now there's a shadow government and the government, the puppet government that was installed 
has not been able to deliver. Why have they not been able to deliver? Because the people, enough people, not, a, not you know, the, everybody, but a critical number, the critical mass that's necessary to stop something bad, they, motive, they got organized and activated. And in fact, I was with them when the women said, you will have to kill us, but you are not going to sell off our petroleum company, Pemex. And they actually had action from inside the Congress and action outside of the Congress. They completely s circled the Congress and, and didn't allow anybody to break the circle. You couldn't get in. And at the same time, you had a few people whose spirit was like ours, and they held office. They were members of the Mexican Congress, and they shut down the Mexican Congress so that Calderon couldn't even call up the bill for a vote. Now, if Mexico can do that, the people of Mexico can do that, I know we can do it too. We just have to believe that we can, and we need to reach that critical mass. And that's part of the reason why I do all of this traveling around, because I want to find that critical mass. <coughs> and I also want to provide people with maybe if we are joined together in our struggles, and at the same time we give hope to each other as we go about doing the daily work of resistance that needs to be done. We need to get up every morning and go to work for eight hours of resistance work, just like they do for eight hours, actually it's more like eight hours times three, of oppression work. That's what it's gonna take. And it is possible, I believe, for us to do that. That's what I'm in the process of doing. Okay, then. Well, let's uh, give a, a resounding thank you to Cynthia McKinney, one of the bravest women in America.